will always remember a conversation I had with my dad when I was just 16 years old. I had just finished my GCSEs and I'd done well. So we were having a discussion about my A-level choices. I had chosen English literature, economics and history. This came as a bit of a shock to my father. And why? I come from a medical family. I'm the eldest child from a Nigerian background. The expectation was that I would do medicine, and importantly, that my younger siblings would also follow suit. So it wasn't part of the plan that I would do anything but maths, physics, chemistry, and biology at Hay level, and then go on to medical school. We had a week of about, you know, lots of discussions, lots of tension, Dad was really, really upset with me because this was not part of the plan. I had to get my mum involved, school teachers. I created a coalition of supporters, really, to try and convince my father that I shouldn't actually do medicine. I should pursue the career in law, which is where my passion really, really lay. We went back to school together. There was a large discussion with my head teacher. It was all very, very dramatic. But in the end, my father actually agreed to fund privately those three A-levels that he had no interest in me doing at all. And importantly, to fund my studies as an overseas student at reading law at Newcastle. So that's what happened. I went on to do those A-levels. Dad paid, thank goodness. I then went on to Newcastle, had a great time in the Northeast, and I thought, this is fantastic. I knew what my next steps were going to be in my career. I thought, I'll just go to Lagos in Nigeria, where I was born, for a short summer holiday, I thought. I'll come back to the UK, and I'll carry on with the next stages of my legal education. That didn't quite work out for me. The summer break ended up becoming a three-year sabbatical in Nigeria. When I landed at Lagos Airport, I received a warm welcome from all my family. I was embraced very, very warmly because I'd been away in the UK at school for so long. Before I knew it, I was being cajoled, emotionally blackmailed, if you will, into staying in Nigeria for a much longer time than I'd intentionally planned, actually. I had one suitcase because I thought I was only going for the summer holiday and I ended up staying for three years. During that time, I thought, what can I do with my time here that would usefully see me along and actually help me to become a lawyer, which was the plan all along? So I went to Nigerian law school, and I spent two and a half years there studying and working. As soon as I finished there, however, I got the first flight back to the UK as, I could, as soon as I could. The next stage in the plan should have been eventually getting to the Law Society. So what should have been the next steps for me was getting a training contract or some sort of concession so I could transfer that Nigerian qualification to a UK one. That did not go according to plan. So I did what we call the transfer test. And the Law Society said, you don't need the two-year training contract. You can do just six months and then you're away, you can qualify. I thought this would be a piece of cake, getting the six months experience. Massive wake up call for me. When I was applying to get the six months experience with those very, very big law firms that I was aiming to work for as a corporate lawyer, I became very, very conscious of the fact that with a name like Funke Abimbola, it was very, very obvious that I wasn't British born. I became very conscious of the fact that there was a lot of discrimination within the legal profession that I so dearly wanted to join. In my desperation, I was only needing six months, let's not forget, to qualify. I drew up a list of the top 100 firms in the country for corporate law. I did the same with the companies I also wanted to work for that I thought would be privileged enough to have me working for them with my lack of work experience and all the rest of it found out the names of the team leaders within each and every one of those organizations, and I cold-called each and every one. 
I had a cheesy sales pitch about myself. I was making lots of flamboyant promises about what I could or could not deliver. But this approach worked. And going back to my father with my tail between my legs and saying I didn't actually manage to qualify after all just wasn't an option. So I had to do this. Finally, I managed to qualify. I qualified almost 16 years ago as a corporate lawyer. My career was ticking along nicely, and I thought, this is great. I've climbed a few mountains at this stage, but I'm getting to the top of the mountain. I was married, and what tends to happen when you've been married for a few years? We had this little guy. <laughs> I was 28 at the time, and I naively thought that surely loads of 28-year-old married women working in the city of London as corporate lawyers are having babies. I found out very, very quickly that I was seemingly the only 28-year-old woman married, working as a corporate lawyer in the city, who decided to have a child. What I very quickly realized was that women were waiting until they were already partner. They were going to wait until they were in their <coughs> mid-30s, become a partner, and only then choose to have their children. Of course, that wasn't part of the plan for me. We wanted to have a baby. I didn't think beyond that. Coming back to work after a year's maternity leave was one of the most terrifying things of my life. I knew I wouldn't be able to do the usual 48-hour stints, 72-hour stints that were required to close a deal. So I asked to work flexibly without realizing that I was actually the first person in the history of my firm to have ever dared to ask to work flexibly. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. We tried all sorts of things, and it just didn't work. I felt such despair <laughs> that I can't evoke it into words. I'd managed to qualify. I'd gained qualification experience after my qualification. I'd had my baby, and to think that even now I wouldn't be able to progress my career was just too frustrating for words. Eventually, I left London altogether. I moved out of London to leafy Hertfordshire, where I was able to work for a regional firm and enjoy much better work-life balance, and not have to worry about working through the night and having ultra-demanding clients to deal with. It was a very, very different thing working in a regional practice. Now, this is an idea worth spreading. You never know what's going to come your way in life. You take all these steps along the way, and you don't really know where you're heading half the time. We live life forwards, but we actually look backwards to truly understand what's going on in our lives. And I found a really pertinent quote from Martin Luther King, where he said that often you're taking that first step even when you can't see the whole staircase. So where are we now? This is my son. He's now 13 years old. So this is that baby that you saw earlier on. What have I learned from the steps I've taken so far? What have I learned about parenting? Do you think there's been any impact whatsoever in having come this far in the way I parent my son? Of course there has been. I'm fully supportive of whatever his goals are. As long as he tries his best and works to his full potential, he can do whatever he wants to do in life. I'm not upset that he doesn't want to become a lawyer. My family aren't that bothered that he doesn't want to become a doctor either, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. But it's had a profound effect on how I parent him because of all the steps I've had to go through along the way. I've put up a picture of Tom Hiddleston for several reasons. Okay. Firstly, he's hot. Okay, so I just have to give credit where it's due. Secondly, he's a phenomenal actor, and I really hope he becomes the next James Bond. The most important reason why I put his picture up, however, is because he had something very, very profound to say about climbing mountains. He said that you never know what's around the corner. It could be everything, or it could be nothing. You keep putting one foot in front of the other, 
And then one day you look back and you've climbed a mountain. Thank you.